Topic 7.2 Summary, Part 2, Nuclear Reactions When a nucleus decays, the total mass of the daughter nucleus plus the emitted particle is less than the mass of the parent nucleus. The loss in mass is released as energy, as determined by Einstein's E equals mc squared. An easier way to calculate the energy released is to calculate the mass defect, then use the conversion factor of one atomic mass unit equals 931.5 mega electron volts. So let's take a look at the alpha decay of polonium-212 into lead-208. We start with a polonium-212 nucleus, and we know it's, we can look up its mass, and when that decays we get a nucleus of lead-208, and we can look up its mass, and we get an alpha particle, and we can look up its mass. If we compare the mass of the original polonium-212 nucleus to the sum of the masses of the lead-208 and the alpha particle, we can see that there's a difference. If we subtract the two, the difference, of course, is called the mass defect, and that number of that amount of mass we can multiply by 931.5 MeVs per atomic mass unit, and we find out that the energy released in that alpha decay is going to be 8.95 mega electron volts. That's how we do these. Okay, here's a vocabulary term that I think we've looked at already, and that's transmutation. So a transmutation occurs when the daughter nucleus is a different element than the parent nucleus. And this happens during alpha or beta decay. It also happens during nuclear reactions, which is what we're going to look at today. While there are many unstable isotopes of elements which will spontaneously decay, in 1919, Ernest Rutherford discovered that it's possible to cause a stable nucleus to become unstable and decay by striking it with another nucleus or high-energy particles such as an alpha particle. So in this equation, we have a an atom of nitrogen-14, which is stable, and we hit it with a high-speed alpha particle. And what happens is the nitrogen-14 transmutates into oxygen-17 and it gives off a proton. We can check that this equation is balanced. Let's first look at the mass numbers. The alpha particle has a mass of 4 and the nitrogen-14 has a mass of 14, so on this side the mass is 18. On the right-hand side we end up with oxygen-17 and a proton which has a mass of 1, so of course you can see that the mass on the right side is also 18. Now let's take a look at the charge numbers. The alpha particle has a charge of plus 2, and meaning it has two protons, and the nitrogen-14, nitrogen always has seven protons, so on this side we have a charge of plus 9 or 9 protons. On the right-hand side of the equation, oxygen has 8 protons, and a proton, of course, has 1 proton, and so we have 9 on that side also. In the 1930s, Enrico Fermi realized that neutrons would be the most effective projectiles to use for causing nuclear reactions. So the question is, why? Well, it turns out that because neutrons have no charge, they're neither repelled by an electron cloud nor the protons in the nucleus. In 1938, Otto Hahn and Fritz Strassmann showed that when uranium atoms are bombarded by neutrons, they sometimes produced smaller nuclei about half the size of the original uranium atoms. This process was dubbed nuclear fission. Here's a model of how nuclear fission is thought to occur. It's called the leak liquid drop model. So we start with a nucleus of uranium-235, and we hit it with a neutron. And the neutron becomes embedded in the uranium-235 nucleus. Again, the reason it can do that is because being neutral, it's not going to be repelled by the protons. And what that does is it causes the nucleus to become excited. It raises to a higher energy state. It's kind of wobbling around and unstable. And eventually what will happen is the nucleus will begin to split into two parts, about each about half the size of the original. So that wobbly, unstable uranium-236 nucleus uh, will break in half to two approximately equal size nuclei. They don't have to be exactly half and half, but it's along that line. And also some neutrons will be released, and quite a bit of energy. So those neutrons get 
kinetic energy and they go flying off and they are likely to encounter other uranium atoms and if they do the chain reaction will continue and you can see how we can get a nuclear chain reaction. So here's what that fission we just saw will look like uh, if we look at it in terms of nuclear equations. So we start with a uranium-235 nucleus and we hit it with a neutron and the neutron gets absorbed into the uranium-235 and we get a very unstable uranium-236 nucleus which hangs around for a very short amount of time and then it splits into two nuclei, we'll call N1 and N2 here, plus some free neutrons. So this is kind of a generic form of what the equation can look like. So here's one possible outcome that we could get. So again, we start with the uranium-235 nucleus. It gets hit by a neutron, and it's, it, it becomes a uranium-236, but it's around for such a short amount of time, we usually don't even show that in the equation. The uranium-236 then could split into, say, a barium-140 and a krypton-93 and three neutrons. And I'll let you do the math, but if you look at the, uh, the mass numbers on the left and right side of the equation, they will add up to be equal. And if you look at the proton numbers on the left and right side of the equations, they also will add up to be equal. At the bottom of the slide, we have another possible outcome. Okay? <clears throat> this is the same thing that could happen, but you could get a different outcome. Uranium-235, we hit it with a neutron. It very briefly becomes an unstable uranium-236, which splits, in this case, into rubidium-90 and cesium-143. And if we add the numbers on the left and the right, they're going to add up, and we get three neutrons again. Notice that rubidium-90 and cesium-143 are pretty far from half and half, but again, they're both medium-sized nuclei compared to the very large original uranium. By knowing that both the mass numbers and the proton numbers have to balance on each side of a nuclear equation, we can figure out sometimes what kind of uh, element we're going to get as a daughter product. So if we look at our example here, we start with lithium-6, and we hit it with a neutron, and we end up with a new daughter nucleus that we are going to figure out in a second, plus an alpha particle. Okay. So if we look at the numbers here, and let's look at the mass numbers first. We have a mass number of 1 for the neutron and 6 for the lithium. And on the right-hand side, an alpha particle is a helium nucleus, so it has two protons and two, two neutrons, so it has a mass number of 4. So our total mass on the left-hand side is 7, and we know that the total mass on the right-hand side needs to be 7. So 3 plus 4 is 7, so this is going to be a 3. Now let's look at the protons. Neutron has no protons, has no charge. Lithium has three protons, so that's three. So the right-hand side has to add up to three, so this is going to be one plus two is three. We already figured out this is a three up here. Okay, so now the question is, what isotope is that? Well, if it has a one proton, we know it's hydrogen, and if it has a mass number of three, it must have one proton and two neutrons, which makes it tritium. Okay, so if we look down here at the bottom, we know that our unknown is hydrogen-3 or tritium. All right, let's calculate the energy released in a fission reaction. So we have uranium-235, and it's struck by a neutron, and it uh, forms uranium-236, which then splits, in this case, into barium-140 and krypton-93 and three neutrons, and I said you get some energy, and now we want to calculate just how much energy we get from this reaction. So we need to know the masses of all of these players. If we look up the mass of a neutron, we'll find that it's 1.008665 atomic mass units. I'm not going to read you the rest of the masses because it's going to get kind of old, but we would look up the mass of uranium-235 and we would get this number. And then we would have to look up the mass of barium-140 and we'd get this number. And then we look up the mass of krypton-93 and we get this number. And then we multiply the mass of our neutron times 3 to find out the remaining mass on the right-hand side. And I need to point something out here uh, for Chris and Jerry, otherwise this is going to bother them. When you look these masses up, you're actually looking up the mass of the atom. So when you look up the mass of uranium-235, this number here is the mass of the protons and the neutrons and the electrons. Now we don't care about electrons when we're doing nuclear equations, but if you realize that the proton count on the left and the right 
balance, then you should realize that the number of electrons on the left-hand side of the equation will equal the number of electrons on the right-hand side of the equation. And ultimately, what we're going to do when we find the mass deficit is subtract the two masses from the left and right. And so the fact that there's electrons in there on both sides, it's just a constant that's the same on both sides, so the difference won't be any different. If it really bothers you, you can subtract out the mass of the electrons, but you're going to get exactly the same answer and you've worked harder. So when we add up all the mass on the left-hand side of the equation, we get this number here. When we add up all the mass on the right-hand side, we get this number here. And then we subtract the two, and that gives us the mass defect, which remember is really a corruption of mass deficit. It's the missing mass which gets turned to energy. So we're almost done here. Are you still having fun? So we have calculated our mass defect, which is over here, and I forgot my units, they're atomic mass units, okay? And now we're going to convert the mass defect to energy in mega electron volts. Now remember, the hard way to do this would be to convert from atomic mass units to kilograms, and then use E equals mc squared, C being the speed of light, and solve for the energy, which would be in joules, and then you'd have to convert from joules to electron volts, and then you'd have to convert from electron volts to mega electron volts. Or you can use this conversion factor right here, that when mass is converted into energy, for every atomic mass unit of mass that's lost, we will gain 931.5 mega electron volts. So all you do is take the mass defect, multiply it by 931.5, and that tells you how much energy is released with each fission. So we get 172.1 mega electron volts per fission. That's it. Okay, that's all, folks. Oh, wait. I have a wacky word definition for you. Okay, today's vocabulary word is control. Control. A short, ugly inmate. That's tricky. <laughs>